In his first State of the Union address, U.S. President Donald Trump makes an appeal for unity in a divided America. He also reveals more details about his controversial immigration reform plan. Three Kenyan television stations will remain off the air until the government has completed investigations into the symbolic swearing in of opposition leader Raila Odinga. And meet the Robocops, officials hope will ease Kinshasa's infamous traffic jams. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCorry. This is Africa 54. U.S. President Donald Trump delivered a message of unity and progress on Tuesday night during his first State of the Union speech. VOA White House Bureau Chief Steve Hammond reports that during the address, the president took credit for a booming U.S. economy, requested $1.5 trillion for infrastructure improvements, and proposed that young people brought illegally to the United States be given a 12-year path to citizenship. President Trump stuck to the script, touting his administration's accomplishments and talking tough about threats from abroad. Around the world, we face rogue regimes, terrorist groups, and rivals like China and Russia that challenge our interests, our economy, and our values. In confronting these horrible dangers, we know that weakness is the surest path to conflict. And unmatched power is the surest means to our true and great defense. North Korea, which is trying to build nuclear-tipped missiles capable of reaching America and its allies, was singled out for criticism. Trump saying its regime has a depraved character. The president made an appeal for domestic political harmony to modernize transportation infrastructure and reform immigration policies. Tonight. I call upon all of us to set aside our differences, to seek out common ground, and to summon the unity we need to deliver for the people. This is really the key. A record number of opposition lawmakers boycotted the president's speech. Members of the Congressional Black Caucus wore a kente cloth as a rejoinder to Trump's recent disparaging remarks about African countries. In the Democrats' official response, Trump's name was never mentioned by the congressman whose grandfather's brother was among America's most famous 20th century presidents. Bullies may land a punch. They may leave a mark. But they have never, not once, in the history of our United States, managed to match the strength and spirit of a people united in defense of their future. In a country deeply polarized about the 45th president, this one presidential address is unlikely to sway a significant percentage of voters. I think his base heard a lot of things in that speech they're going to like, but uh, generally my guess is it's going to fall flat with the broader public. I mean, it was a long, hour, more than an hour and 20 minutes, and, and, and there weren't really uh, developed ideas for how to move forward. It really was sort of a laundry list of ideas but without a lot of specific substance. Despite the president's call for unity and declaring his first year in office a great success, storm clouds loom on the horizon. A special counsel continues to investigate the Trump campaign's contacts with Russian operatives during the 2016 election season and whether the president, once in office, obstructed justice. Steve Herman, VOA News, Washington. Well, for more perspective on President Trump's first State of the Union address, I'm joined by VOA National Correspondent Jim Malone. Jim, welcome back to Africa 54. Thanks, Vincent. Now, as we mentioned, the speech sought to uh, strike a kind of a conciliatory tone here, kind of try to unite uh, the nation. Did the president achieve that in any way? Well, I think anyone who saw any bit of the speech could see from the reaction of the Democrats in the House chamber that... It wasn't having an immediate effect right away. A lot of Democrats did not applaud at various times during the speech. There were some shots of the House leader for the Democrats, Nancy Pelosi, looking not none too pleased, <laughs> if you will. I will say there's a couple of uh, quick instant polls out uh, post State of the Union that are somewhat favorable to the president, shows that it was the speech was generally favorably received, but we should add a caution that Usually the instant polls after these State of the Union addresses don't have a lot 
mm -hmm. you know, of impact going forward. A, a few other things that people are kind of uh, trying to pay a lot of attention to is like the immigration, mm -hmm. uh, you know, issue that is big. Now, what did you make of the framing and, and how, to what extent did that kind of help in uh, advancing the conversation between the Republicans and the Democrats? Right, good question, because there is a plan out there by the administration now to sort of address a comprehensive immigration overhaul. And of course, at the key of it is the fate of these so-called dreamers, the younger immigrants brought here as children illegally. Uh, but what you heard from some Democrats is they were annoyed with some of the descriptions that the president used to describe the the sort of security threat posed in his view by certain immigrants coming across. So that could be a problem getting everybody to work together. Overall, though, the speech, you'd have to say, we saw a softer tone from the president than we've seen in the past. That tells me he is interested in reaching out to more independent voters. He needs to broaden his base because he's got historically low approval ratings for a new president. Yes. and. and but it, it took quite a, some credit for the economy and says mm -hmm. we live perhaps in the best of times in terms of the economic uh, environment. Uh, how accurate, what are you hearing, what do people say, how, how accurate that is? Well, for one thing, he, he talked about the biggest tax cut in American history. It's actually the eighth largest. <laughs> He's well down the list. But all presidents, to their credit, do take credit for good economic times. But even the polls show that a fair bit of the credit so far continues to be given to his predecessor, Barack Obama, who also enjoyed some economic success, especially in the latter stages of his presidency. So the president is want to take credit. That's what they do. But with Donald Trump, there's that extra added sort of exaggeration, perhaps in some cases, of how much credit is due. All right. So we'll wait and see. Perhaps there will be a tweet that might change the conversation again. Thank you very much, Jim, Thank for you, joining us and offering those insights. Well, Jim Maloney is VOA's national correspondent. Turning now uh, to other places, Africans account for only about 5% of undocumented migrants arriving in the United States. Activists say they are largely excluded from the broader conversation about immigration reform, especially along the U.S. border with Mexico. VOA's Hanok Fenton reports from San Antonio, Texas, where African asylum seekers face immediate detention and prolonged court battles to avoid being deported. Most of the clients for Texas immigration lawyer Priscilla Olivares are Latino migrants arrested after crossing the border from Mexico. Lately, she's been seeing more African migrants detained along this route. Though their journeys may be different, many of their stories are the same. A majority of the individuals that we see are submitting asylum applications because they've either suffered some form of persecution or, in, or are in fear of suffering persecution if they are forced to return to their home country. Olivares is working on an immigration case for Simeon Coroma from Sierra Leone. He's being held at this Texas detention center. The U.S. Department of Homeland Security would not allow VOA inside to interview Coroma, so we spoke to him on the phone. I left Sierra Leone because of the persecution I suffered. For Simone, it means that he is in, in danger of being returned back to his home country. Um, but he is in fear of returning back to his home country because of the persecution that he has suffered or that he fears that he will suffer if he's forced to return. Coroma says he reached the United States by traveling with other migrants through South and Central America from Brazil. We spent like four days walking over 200 kilometers. We climbed like seven mountains, crossing the, the river Panama. It was really deadly. Coroma's asylum claim was denied in October by an immigration judge who ordered his deportation. Appealing that decision now means more time behind bars. I'm tired. I've been in detention for nine months. And spending another eight months in detention would be too disastrous for me. Immigration courts are overwhelmed by the number of people arriving in the United States seeking political asylum. Jennifer Long runs an immigration shelter in Austin, Texas, where refugees released from detention stay until they secure a work permit. Today, the majority of Casa Marianela's residents are from Sub-Saharan Africa. They're unfortunately required to finish their immigration case while they're detained and without access to an attorney, usually. People who are in detention 
do not generally win asylum. So then uh, people are deported directly from the detention centers. Immigration lawyer Olivares says many asylum claims do not succeed because migrants fail to share important details about their case. Individuals who have suffered so much trauma in their home country, unfortunately that trauma can become normalized and then they don't think to share it to with us or to the judge when it's so vital that they do that. Though overall arrests along the U.S.-Mexico border are down, Sub-Saharan Africans continue to represent a growing number of migrants detained and seeking asylum to start a new life in America. Henok Fante, VOA News, San Antonio, Texas. In East Africa, the threat on media freedoms enters its second day in Kenya. The country's interior minister said on Wednesday three Kenyan television stations will remain off the air indefinitely as the government investigates the symbolic swearing-in of opposition leader Raila Odinga. Independently owned Citizen TV and Radio, KTN and NTV, were switched off on Tuesday after they transmitted live coverage of an opposition ceremony to swear in Odinga. Odinga, whose supporters say he is Kenya's legitimate leader and that President Uru Kenyatta's election was neither free nor fair, took a symbolic presidential oath at the ceremony. Fred Matiangi says the opposition event was an attempt to subvert and overthrow the legally constituted government, adding that they were also investigating the swearing-in. That as a result of what happened yesterday, we have commenced a wide-scale investigation targeting individuals and organizations who include but may not be limited to certain media houses. We will act decisively, but strictly according to the law. And as long as those investigations continue, there are certain actions that are going to remain in place. For example, the media houses will remain switched off until we are completed some of the investigations that we are carrying out. For more on the latest developments in Kenya, Eric Odor, Secretary General of the Kenyan Union of Journalists, joins me by phone from Nairobi. Good evening, Eric. Uh, Eric? Eric? Yes, I can yes. hear you. Now, I have to say this, having lived through the Daniel Arap Moy regime, I never, I don't remember seeing televisions switched off. Is the media in Kenya under great threat today as we speak? Yes, uh, the media in Kenya is under great threat because even during uh, former regime, uh, Daniel Moyes, uh, Kanu regime, we never saw such kind of crackdown on uh, the media because uh, the government says that they are even investigating uh, individual journalists whom they believe that could have also be working with uh, the opposition. So actually, that is uh, currently that is the position in Kenya. But uh, the, this uh, regime actually, from uh, when it took over, even in the first term, is a regime that has never been uh, friendly to the media. We've seen a number of attempts actually to uh, limit the press, press freedom here in Kenya, probably through legislation, physical attacks on journalists, coming up with the new policies that are meant to serve off the media uh, revenue that is needed to run the media uh, organizations in Kenya. Now, we know that uh, the Constitution, as it is currently supposed to really uh, protect the freedoms, uh, such as those of the media, uh, how well are the courts in Kenya placed to tackle what we are witnessing today, this uh, crackdown on the media? Actually, our only service here is going to be the courts, because uh, they have helped us before. When I remember uh, two years ago, the government was trying to enact some laws that were against the Constitution that will have given the government more powers to carry out uh, such crackdowns on the media. But the courts actually uh, declared uh, those sections of the law as unconstitutional. So, as, as, as unconstitutional. So we believe that actually if we go to court, because I think that's our next cause of action, going to court so that we can get an order that will compel the government to switch on uh, these TVs, uh, TV television stations so that they can go back on yeah. air. Uh, could you say that perhaps uh, the swearing in of Raila Odinga in that event yesterday has exposed the ugly side of this current government? Yeah, exactly. Actually, that is what we've been telling uh, the, the whole world, that Kenyan press freedom has actually is under threat. 
because we've received a lot of criticism from members of the public who believe that the Kenyan media was not as authoritative as it has always been. But actually, this is now confirmed what I have been telling uh, the public and even the whole world that the Kenyan media actually has been struggling to defend uh, its uh, independence. Now, this actually brings everything into the open that uh, apparently the government has been trying to interfere with the operations and, edi and uh, editorial decisions of uh, uh, media houses. Well, we have to say, Eric, I have never seen this. We hope things change. Thank you very much for joining us today. Eric Odor is the Secretary General of the Kenya Union of Journalists. And I want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We are also streaming our show live on Facebook. So check us out and share our show with your friends. Find me on Twitter at VOA Vince McCory. Now coming up, Robo Cups are now a reality in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Stay with us. Nigeria, the West African International Petroleum Conference and Exhibition is taking place in Lagos next week. The event is built as a platform for representatives from across the West African energy industry to discuss and share their insight and knowledge uh, towards creating strategies that are beneficial to all stakeholders. To tell us more about the conference, Bank Anthony Okoroafo, uh, chairman of the Petroleum Technology Association of Nigeria, joins me live uh, via Skype from London. Uh, good evening, Mr. Okurafo. Yeah, good evening. Now, uh, this uh, conference, uh, well, brings together, hopefully you're saying uh, several thousands of people. Tell us exactly uh, the objective as regards the oil industry in the entire West African region. Well, um, the objective of this conference is basically to bring uh, the players, all the stakeholders to Lagos to share experiences uh, and also look at game-changing solutions and also to the places where you produce this oil from, let them be part of the show, understand what goes on in the industry and understand why we have to produce these oils uh, in a safe and environmental mm. manner. Now, you know, most people from especially the oil producing regions of Nigeria say that they don't see the benefits of uh, the oil. Uh, tell me, w what exactly do you think uh, in your conversation could be said, could be done to ensure that people from Niger Delta can start seeing the benefits of the oil coming from their region? Now, um, this conference, a lot of people can see a lot of opportunities on areas they can play a role in the industry. You know, instead of the conferences that is happening in the U.S., in the U.K., this one is back home. So most of the stakeholders from the Niger Delta who are interested in playing, providing any service in the industry, this is a good conference for them to network, to see what is being done, and see how they can participate in the industry. Now, the, the issue, the biggest question has always been the willingness of the governments to ensure first they eliminate corruption around the oil industry, but also make sure they drive uh, the development to the oil producing regions. Is the government owning up to its own failures? Well, um, the key thing here is to create the opportunities for the people. Like, if you go to some of the communities where you get this crude oil from, there is no electricity. So the ones you can create opportunities for them, empower the people, show them that they are all stakeholders in the, in the oil game, I think we should be, everybody should be fine. 
Well, we hope for the best, and uh, hopefully when we talk again next time, things will have improved in the oil sector. Thank you very much, Mr. Okoroafo. Thank you very much. Well, um, Mr. Bank Anthony Okoroafo is the chairman of the Petroleum Technology Association of Nigeria. Could robotic traffic cops become the ultimate answer to solving traffic jams in the Democratic Republic of Congo? While well, the eight-foot robots are now the talk of Kinshasa, and they are giving human traffic police serious competition, viewers Paul Ndiho has our report. The Congolese capital, Kinshasa, has one of the worst traffic problems in the region. In uh, the sprawling uh, city of uh, over 12 million, residents are often said they plan uh, their lives around uh, the heavy traffic, which usually continues throughout the day. Driving uh, short distances can often take hours. It's confusion, it's chaos everywhere. As you can see, people don't even observe simple traffic rules. Everybody wants to get in on the road at the same time. The traffic patterns are very unpredictable in the city. If you are driving to a location less than a mile away, you might need to give yourself 60 minutes lead time. And sometimes it's even faster to walk. Disgusted by the city's traffic, Ceresa Ize, a Congolese engineer, set out to find a solution. Working under the umbrella organization of Congolese women engineers, they developed a homegrown innovation dubbed robotic traffic lights. It's an invention that makes it difficult for motorists to get away with the traffic violations. The robot has two important applications. The first application is for road safety. It functions like any traffic lights in the world. The second application is the surveillance cameras. The robots send images in real time to the monitoring team. The solar-powered aluminium robots are gigantic. Towering over the streets are jammed with cars and motorcycles, blasting their horns and jostling for room. Many commuters are forced to travel in old vehicles that often leave them stranded. What's right about the robot is that it gives you clear signals. Unlike traffic police, I think the robot is better because they don't stop and talk to you. I prefer the robot because you cannot distract the robot and the traffic police can ask for money. So I prefer the robot. Since 2013, these robots have been helping to control traffic with rotating chest and surveillance cameras that record the flow of traffic and send real-time images to the police station, who use the footage to monitor infractions. What started out as a pilot project has now expanded beyond the capital city to include Lumumbashi and Matadi. Isaiah says that this technology is being adopted in other countries in the region. We are ready. We are waiting for other countries to invite us to transfer our technology, and we have already signed a contract with CAR. We are waiting for them to finance the project. We are in talks with Ivory Coast, Congo, Brazzaville, and Gabon. Not all motorists are fully on board with the robots. The robot works fine, it's good, but sometimes it does not work very well. We drivers sometimes don't follow its signals. Some critics say that at a cost of about 25,000 US dollars per unit, the robots are too expensive for most of the cities in the region. Reporting for VOA News, Paul Ndiho, downtown Kinshasa. Well, that's uh, rather cool. It's time now for a short break. Still to come on Africa 54. Grab a latte prepared by Jap uh, Japan's first robot barrister. We'll be right back.
in Mali, Colombian nun kidnapped in the southern part of the country nearly a year ago, appears in a jihadist video and appeals for the Pope's intervention. Local broadcasters claim Kenya's government orchestrated a media blackout to prevent live TV coverage of opposition leader Raila Odinga's mock inauguration as the quote-unquote people's president. Egyptian President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi warns opposition leaders against boycotting the March presidential elections, saying he'll die first before jeopardizing security and stability of the nation. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, a cholera epidemic persists with 37 deaths and 853 cases since November, especially hitting high-density cities in Kinshasa and the north and south Kivu. Welcome back to Africa 54, and here's what's trending. Japan's first robot cafe opened its doors to media on Tuesday, with a robot replacing the barista to serve coffee to patrons. Customers at Henna Cafe, meaning strange cafe in Japanese, have to scan a QR code printed on a ticket bought from a vending machine in order to get a 320 yen or $3 coffee. The robot barista is able to serve a maximum of five cups of coffee at one go. Uh, one cup takes about four minutes to make. The general manager says automation will help keep the price of uh, a cup of coffee low. Uh, the robot cafe follows a trend to solve labor shortages in a rapidly aging Japanese society. Well, next up, researchers in South Korea are showing off their people carrying robot designed for rescue missions or helping people with disabilities. Standing 2.2 meters tall and weighing 270 kilograms, the FX2 can carry a 70 kilogram passenger. The developers see a future for biped people carrying robots and situations where wheels cannot operate. FX2 carried the flame in the 2018 PyeongChang Winter Olympics torch relay last month. And finally, amputee Jason Burns uh, did not imagine that a prosthetic arm would... Okay, there we go. That's right, amputee Jason Burns did not imagine that a prosthetic arm would allow him to play the piano. But a prosthesis developed by researchers at Georgia Institute of Technology uses ultrasound technology to allow him to move each finger on the limb independently. But making music isn't limited to the piano. Thanks to the Georgia Tech team, he already has a specially designed prosthesis that allows him to play the drums. And that's what's trending today. And that's our show. Thanks a lot for watching. Have a good night. Welcome to English in a Minute. So, you know what happy is? And medium comes between small and large. To find a happy medium. So is this idiom about feeling kind of happy? How is it going with your neighbor? Is he still complaining about your playing the trombone at night? He was, but it's fine now. How did you guys work it out?